Just doing a little bit of reading. Went over the prodigal son, the lost son, depends on what your Bible says. There's a bunch of different names for it. What a broad spectrum allegory for not only God's saving graceful tendencies and his desire to save every last one of the lost, whether they've fully given up faith or not, right? Because when you go off into a foreign land and you're acting as though you're part of the world, you're basically dead. Hence the statement by the father that this one was dead and now he's alive. What's interesting to me is that it's labeled the prodigal son, singular. Uh, but it's, it's technically, if we look at both situations for both sons, they're both kind of lost, right? One, the one that goes off and uh, abuses all kinds of grace coming from the Lord, never fully gives up his position in the family because you know, clearly the moment things go tough, the, the one that left's like, ah, my father, his, even his servants never run out of food. I'll go back because I've sinned against him and just ask for the, the least, the least you know, position in his, in his, in his family, maybe he'll, he'll let me, you know, come be one of the servants, which was a fairly humble thing to say, fairly humble thing to do, uh, especially after having gone off and abused the grace of his father for so long. Then we see this picture of the older son, or, or the, the assumption is he's older, but he's in a position where he's stayed on the farm, he's been consistent, he never really left his father's side. But when we hear his words and his attitude towards this entire situation of his brother returning, we see arrogance, we see anger, we see impatience, um, we see almost what looks to me like the manifestations of legalism coming out of his personality, sort of like a demon, to attack the other brother for not being like him because he didn't stick around the entire time, although his father says, Everything that I've had this entire time has been yours. You've never been without. You've never been in a position where you're not taken care of. And then he, he makes the comment that, you know, you've never even given me a goat to, to share with my friends for sacrifice. Never once do we hear, though, that the older son ever asked for it. Um, second, what we see is essentially this arrogant attitude from the, the, the brother that stayed versus the one that left assuming that because he stayed and because he has not necessarily gone far away from the father physically that somehow he has earned a better spot uh he's 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 a better person or better believer in this case and that his um i'll just say legalistic approach was more correct and that somehow even though he probably knows deep down inside that his legalism could never actually earn his place in the family and it purely had to do with the grace of his father that he felt entitled to that position. So, ironically, not so ironically, this has probably been going on since Adam and Eve and their, their children on down, but you have some that cannot help but abuse grace and yet never want to relinquish faith. In this case, we see the son having gotten his wits together and, and turned back to the father so as to not go down that path of, of punishment to the point of uh, sin unto death. Um, but on the other hand, we see a son who has, from all outward, all, all outward perceptions, um, been a good son, stayed consistent, and worked really, really hard for a long time. But the moment he opens his mouth, he shows his hand that even though he has enacted the good thing, he still holds this arrogant, sinful, elitist position over his brother. This is the same exact struggle that goes on between, I would say, grace abu abusers or... Uh, libertinists, if you will, people that just believe life's a free-for-all because Christ paid for things. Um, but then again, eventually, just like with the prodigal son or the lost son here, they go off, hopefully, and find out that their um, friendliness with the world has caused them nothing but pain and suffering and that they should come back. Unfortunately, a great percentage of those people never do. They end up becoming the seed on the rock that goes out, gets into trouble, and decides to blame God for their issues. Um, but thankfully, in both of these instances, we don't see any sign of this, but we do see the struggle on the one side of legalism and on the other side of being tempted and, and acting out the abusive, uh, the abusive tendency towards God's grace, the Father's grace in this particular example. It's quite, it's quite stunning. Really, if we're, if we're being honest and we take a step back and really look at the entirety of the parable, in this case, the Father has some pretty exceptional patience with two wayward let's be honest, relatively jackass-like sons. One that, you know, does the hard work and has a bad attitude, and one that just goes away and has no attitude and causes all pain to his father. So you've got one causing pain even though he's sticking around. You've got one causing pain even though he's taking off. You've got two scenarios where 
very different behaviors, but really, in the end, is their sinfulness all that different? No, it's really not. The legalist tempts himself the legalist tempts himself to come to a position where he feels because he can look back and see a certain amount of success perhaps in his behavior, kind of like Paul did before he came to faith, where he looks at all of his actions, he says, "I seem to be excelling amongst all of my brethren, and yet when it comes to this one little thing of coveting, Paul could never nail it down. Unfortunately, the legalist who stays in defiance of the facts of the issues, will not actually stare at what it is they know they're doing wrong. They will not address it until it's forced upon them. But just the same way that the libertine son, when he takes off, eventually stubs his toe on Satan's world, God is not going to allow the arrogant one to get away with this arrogant attitude without some sort of, perhaps initially a gentle reminder, but then eventually in comes the spankings. And later on, unfortunately, a very high percentage of legalists end up rejecting the Lord because they cannot and will not accept that they have nothing to do with remaining saved. It might not have to do with the initial salvation, Christ paying for them on the cross, but they're under the impression that their repentance and confession and that their obvious outward um, positioning uh, towards the Father, perhaps they want to look religious to the outside world, perhaps they want man's acknowledgement that they're doing the good thing with the Lord. This is really, really common. They want, they want deference, they want respect, And they want it all based upon their actions, not upon Christ, which is really unfortunate. They make it about themselves. Whereas the libertinists, they're also technically making it about themselves, but on the extreme other end by saying, what's the point? Christ already paid for it. It's almost over anyway. And there's also a very good chance that the libertinists also hold a bunch of other doctrines that give them the excuses to want to go and do what they want to do. Like, once saved, always saved. Pre-trib rapture. Why do we have to get ready for it? We're not going to be here. Ism. Nonsense. It's, it's really quite fascinating, it is. In the end, obviously, those three, parallel, those three parables in order in, in those, uh, those verses in Luke all very much are showing the absolute, overtly adoring grace of God. He is so incredibly patient, so much so that in this particular picture, nobody is correct except the Father. So, little tidbits. Perhaps you didn't see this the first time you read through it. Um, reality on the ground is none of us are perfect, and we're always hopefully, trying to stay away from thinking our actions are adding anything, but also staying away from overindulgence and too much sinful behavior because all it's going to do is distract us and tempt us and bring us out of that close fellowship with the Lord where we are most capable in the Spirit to learn the Word, grow the Word, help others do the same by coming into our own ministry, which, again, the whole goal of this channel, and I think the Bible as well. Anyhow, let me know what you guys think. wanted to keep it kind of short. thought it was... Uh, a series of interesting tidbits. Um, what a graceful and adoring God we have. I think he's crazy, but I'm not going to say no to it because, well, we absolutely need him. And uh, I pray the same for you guys too. Always stay in the Lord's graces. Avoid the extremes. Avoid extreme legalism where you think you did anything, but also avoid overtly sinning and going out of your way to tempt yourself, to hurt yourself, and to put a wedge between you and the Lord for your walk here on the earth so as to avoid tripping further into sin, temptation, uh, and making yourself an ineffective witness. These are very, very, very important facets of the Christian life. Let me know what you think. Talk to you soon.